A pastor had called me and said, um, all the women from my church are coming to this conference, but my wife's not coming. She suffers severely with clinical depression. She takes uh, medication, but nobody in our church knows because she thinks it would hurt my ministry. Is there any way you would meet with her privately? And because she wouldn't come to that. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, if she's willing to. And I remember um, inviting her to come to the hotel where I was staying and inviting her. We found a room and she wouldn't even make eye contact with me. And I, I said to listen, you don't have to tell me anything about your life. But if you don't mind, I would like to tell you a little of my story. And I shared with her. And I have to say those two hours were two of the most precious hours I've ever had in my life. One of the things that I think we are called to do is to steward our suffering. Ooh, uh, it's yeah. such a holy so privilege cool. to steward your suffering. Yes. When I was diagnosed with mental illness, it was very, nobody in the church talked about it. It just was not something we talked about. And I remember even the first time I went to fill my prescription, I kept thinking, I hope I don't bump into anybody who knows me. And what will I say if they ask me, you know, what I'm getting? And and then I began to see something different. There's a mystery of the kingdom. It's almost like some of the gifts that God gives you make your hands bleed when you open them. Yeah. But inside is actually what you've been longing for all your life, an wow. awareness of the presence of God in the painful places of life. And I remember when Rick and Kay Warren um, lost Matthew, their son, uh, he had been struggling with mental illness since he was just a little boy and they had done everything they could and more. And then when Matthew finally put an end to his journey here, I watched Kay grieve. I mean, speechless, really. There's no words. But then a couple of years down the line, she and Rick began this. Um, they have this incredible work now for, for people and for families of people who are struggling with mental health. And she asked me if I would speak at their first symposium on the church mm -hmm. and mental health. And the church was packed with mm -hmm. people who either were struggling themselves, who yes. worked with people who were struggling, who heard family members. And many of them had lost loved ones, mm -hmm. had died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing there at the podium that night and, th and feeling this incredible sense of the presence of God mm -hmm. and saying, and my opening line, I could never have said two years before, mm -hmm. I said, I am profoundly grateful for the gift of mental illness because it means I can look into the eyes of somebody else who's struggling and say, me too, you are not alone. And what you need to know is Jesus is on this path with us. That the very things I believe the enemy intends to use to destroy us or to destroy how we see God. Yes. When we steward that suffering, whatever, and it'll be, some, it'll be different in everybody's life. You know what you've struggled with and you've struggled with and you've struggled and you've struggled and our viewers have struggled will be different. But when we will steward that suffering as an offering to the Lord, He does things that are just otherworldly. They're of another kingdom, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It reminds me of, of I, I'm in tears. There's this reality of the upside down kingdom mm -hmm. yeah. that we get to play a role in. And uh, I'll be honest, like I, I do not like the idea of stewarding my, my suffering. Mm -hmm. I want to steward other things like my planner, my, or my calendar and my kids. Like I'm good at that. I can steward even my assignments. I can steward well. Uh, my brother, I'm coming up on his one year anniversary of his death here pretty soon. And I have had the hardest time reconciling some of my suffering in that. And I've asked God the question, like, how do I, how do I steward my calling in the midst of so much pain? And it's not that I've not walked through pain before I have, but this pain felt different because I thought I was stewarding the calling well, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah. And I almost, I almost equated my brother dying to me somehow misstewarding my calling well. And this like very twisted, warped idea of like how God was operating in my life. And what's even wilder, and I'll be very vulnerable and honest, this was the week that my first book was ever published. It was the week that my first published book was going out into the world. My brother dies. And I'm left like, God, how do you want me to steward my calling in the midst of so wow. much pain? And this is what he said to me. He said, the presence of pain has never meant the absence of me. Wow. Thank you, God. And the presence of pain does not mean the absence of God. And I remember sitting in my living room. There had been so many flowers delivered to my house that week, but not because of my book launch, but because of my brother's death. And I remember looking around and looking at all these beautiful flowers and asking and, and really saying, God, I, I had another idea for what my calling was going to look like in this season. Yeah. And then he said, now you've got the unexpected gift of suffering that you get to learn from. Yeah. And I've learned to steward my calling from that place yeah. 
and still am in a way that I've never known before. Because before that, I could have given you a more put together answer. Yeah. And now it's just more raw and undone. And I can tell you, I've seen God move in it. And I've learned with him to steward my calling through daily obedience, taking him to him my suffering. Like, God, I don't know what to do with this. You're right. yeah. It doesn't make any sense and it hurts. And I want to live on mission. So help me. And yeah. he has. That's like very practical. And he literally has in the day to day. And it's been it's been a miracle to see it flesh out. So when I first became a follower of Jesus, I didn't grow up in the church. I would hear the words stewardship quite a bit, and I sort of just tied it to money, to like offering and giving. And reality is, is that stewardship really is how we tend to the things God's given us, right? The gifts given to us, our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasure, our children, the opportunities, Anything that's un under our two feet, we're called to tend to. So think about it like uh, a farmer, right? They are called to tend to the field. Stewarding is tending. And so as we live in the kingdom of God as daughters and maybe some sons who are watching, the reality is that we're invited into a very different idea of what success and of what purpose is. The upside down kingdom in scripture, what Jesus says is the reality that it is less of us and more of him. It is suffering where we find joy, right? It is in our weakness that we find the most power in Christ. And so everything that you think before you met Jesus or even now that might be remotely um, tied to success, throw it out the window. Because in the kingdom of God, he says that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So everything that we think about stewardship has to align with that. And so here's what um, I wanna talk about with that. As we are stewarding our gifts well, we are serving for those around us. We are loving those around us, not for our own ambitions, right? It's not for us, but it's for Jesus. And so when we talk about the upside down kingdom, we're talking about building the kingdom of God for his glory and not our own as we steward our calling well. I think one of the most um, transformative things that happens in those moments of, of suffering or, or stewarding pain is when we shift from our question being why God mm -hmm. to what God. Mm. Like, and I have had so many things over the years where I have found myself just going, God, why? Why did that happen? Right. Um, mm. My dad was running in a triathlon. He fell at the age of 59. They thought he had twisted his ankle and he actually had gone into cardiac arrest and died on the course. And for years, I just remember saying like, why God, why God? Why? Fast forward the clock 15 years from there, I get a call from my sister-in-law um, asking me to come over because she awoke to, my brother had stopped breathing. And she was standing there with their seven month old baby. Oh, God. Just, yes. you know, and in those moments, you're like, why, God? Why? Yeah. And I have found that making peace with God's mystery yes. is critical to our transformation because God doesn't owe us an answer yeah. to why. But when we shift the question to God, what do you want to do through this? What do you want to do in me? What do you want to do through me? We've got this prayer hall outside of our um, auditorium at our church. And, and we say that the, the service is really just the appetizer for the prayer hall because that's really where, where the real work goes down. And um, almost every single time I go into the prayer hall and pray with people, undoubtedly somebody will come up to me and they've just lost a loved one. They've just walked into an unforeseen season of grief. And it's like, I have this moment of God just quietly whispering to me, mm -hmm. yeah. this yeah. is what I'm doing through your own pain. Right. Yes. Yes. You have stewarded this loss to now be used in yeah. someone else's life, yes. right? And, yeah. and that to me is, you know, that's, that's where calling is so much higher than career. Right. It, yeah. It's so much higher than yes. um, this calling to steward the story God has written in my life. Yes. And calling is, is all about something that's eternal. Yes. Like a, a career is like 
what am I going to do from the nine to five? Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's so much greater. It's so much grander. Mm -hmm. And it is about the Lord's story, not my own. Yeah. I think the through line that I'm hearing um, that makes stewardship of any capacity possible is, is hope. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hope being a position yes. of great expectation that God yes. will do yes. something good. Yes. Um, because I think sometimes we misconceive mm -hmm. stewardship to just be consistent, right? right? Um, but when you read the parable of the talents, mm -hmm. the one with the one mm -hmm. talent and that buried it and was later called a wicked and lazy servant, technically he was very consistent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But then to have great hope, yeah. um, to gr have great expectation That's right. that yeah. even in this just unimaginable loss mm -hmm. yeah. that God can and will do something yeah. that spurs us on mm -hmm. to live by faith and by love. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe hope is the ground on which faith and love thrives, yeah. right? Yeah. To have all these actions to, to um, minister to those that have mental health issues, yeah. to minister to those who've lost loved ones. It's, it, that's only possible because in our deep pain, yes. we still expect God to do something good. Yeah. And I think as long as we could expect that, then we could steward any season of our lives. I remember when I went through all the losses and failures during 2020, I thought, well, I'm done. I'm not only done, I am done for. Um, I felt like there was like such a finality to all these letdowns and failures. Um, however, to continue to steward my calling into ministry, to continue to steward my calling as a leader, as a communicator of the gospel, I had to believe that God was just not done with me yet. And something that I say often is as long as you breathe, God's not done with you yet. And so that's the hope that continues to allow us to steward the now. Well, you, you listen to, and we all know this, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Yeah. And then it's list after list after list yeah. of people, yeah. right? Yeah. That found themselves in circumstances that they would not have chosen. Sure. They found themselves in loss that yeah. they would not have written into their story. Right. Yes. They, they were in a, in a situation that if they could have changed it, they would have. Yes. And yet they did not give up hope. Yeah. They didn't give up hope. I think about the heroes of the faith quite a bit, and I became sort of obsessed with each of their lives and read every single one of their stories, try to understand their postures, their their the timeline. And one of the things, and we talked about it just a few minutes ago, it's eternal perspective. Mm -hmm. And right. they went through a deep season of suffering that, where they were able to grasp and understand eternal perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And eternal perspective changed the way that they lived the rest of their lives. And it was powerful and it was from a place of hope uh, because their lens wasn't in the temporal. Like they weren't moved by all of the things that had happened. And not that we don't get to see the stories. God says like, I need you to see, watch all of the things they've walked through and yet... Yeah. The stewardship of the call was because they had eternal perspective and their eyes were set on me. And I that that is such a guardrail for us when we're tempted to to lose sight of God, right? Mm -hmm. To lose sight of his activity, to missteward the calling because of our fear. Yeah. Jesus, help us have eternal perspective to steward the suffering and all of the things well, because we know that you're good. Yeah. Because there's a hope that's unwavering. Yeah. I love this because, you know, as you were sharing about that, I was like, oh, wait, that's so good. And just going back to Hebrews 11, and, you know, it says, these all died in mm -hmm. faith, yes. although they had not received the things that were promised. Right. Yes. And so you you see these people that they, they just live their lives in stewardship. Yeah, without often seeing the harvest. Mm -hmm. Without ever seeing yes. what they were working yeah. for yeah. in hopes of yeah. eternity. Yeah. So I think that's really cool. Like when you think about it, you know, Hebrews 11 is all heroes of the faith, yes. but really it's also heroes who stewarded. Heroes yeah. of the mundane. <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. I think one of the most beautiful moments in the Old Testament is where God has Moses actually up on the ledge mm. oh and he gosh. looks out. Uh-huh. 
at the promised land, but doesn't go in. Yeah. And there's this moment. I, I, I did some, some deeper study on it once. Um, you know, every single other time throughout the Old Testament where Moses asked for God to move, he always had his staff. And it was this like physical thing that he held on to, right? And it was a gift from God because he was insecure. He was unsure if he could actually be the one that God would use to, to free his people. And what's so interesting to me is at that moment when they're out looking over the promised land where he does not go into, there's no mention of the staff. And the deeper study that I understood around that was that Moses really got to the point where it was not about the promised land. It was about the presence of God. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Exodus 33, there's that moment where literally he says to God, well, if you don't go with us, Yes. Don't, make don't send go. me. Mm -hmm. wow. Don't send me. And I think that is such a beautiful picture of it's not about that destination yeah. that we're trying to get to. It's not about that, you know, big lofty purpose, exactly. right? It's about, do I get to do this with God? Yeah. That's my purpose. I get to do this life Oof. with God. Okay. And you want to hear something so cool that's going to give it gives me chills about Moses all the time because he stood up, he looks over the promised land, he doesn't get to see, he doesn't get to go in. But as we're talking about this, it's about eternity, it's about eternity, yeah. it's about Jesus. Mm. He does go in on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, yes, he does. That's in the New right. Testament. That's yeah. right. He goes to the promised yes. land with yes. Jesus yes. Yes. and he gets to go in. Yes. And yes. even then, and even then, it's not about him. Yes. And it's all yes. still about Jesus. Yeah. My favorite theologian, Beth Moore, says this about heaven. She says, listen, don't forget that you're not going to have to process earth when you get to heaven. Yeah. You're not going to have to, we're not going to process earth. We're not going to get up there and be like, okay, I'm sorry, guys, can we just talk about that? Yes. <laughs> we're not going to process it. It's a lot. I have so many questions. It was a lot. <laughs> we're not going to have to process it. And so we can have our lives wrung out right yeah. now. And it's such a perspective shift. And it, like, this is the work of stewarding the calling so that glory can be all over your life. Come so on. that every part of your suffering yes. can actually be stewarded. Yeah. So that you can live out this embodied 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that is power and made perfect in your weakness. You know, somebody might ask, like, how can I look for and see God's glory in everything as I try to steward my calling? How can I look at my suffering? How can I look at my hardships? How can I look at my weaknesses and see confirmation and beauty and, and God's glory and His grace and all of that? And I guess, honestly, my truest answer is this. What is the other option? I either look for Him and I look for His glory and I look for His presence and I look for His power and I'm encouraged or I don't look for him and I see a lot of humanity and a lot of brokenness. Charles Spurgeon says, we don't always get what we want, we almost always get what we expect. And if we expect to see God move, if we expect to see God's hand, if we expect to see God making much of himself through his kids, we'll see it. What has confirmation looked like as you learn to steward your calling? What does it look like for God to come? Because I think we're all going to agree now. It's not a bunch of people sitting in a room saying like, Jeannie, you should be in ministry. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> That's not been it. Nope. Right. My background growing up was I, I never saw female ministers. Mm. And so as somebody that felt extremely called to the pulpit, yeah. extremely called to ministry, I did not know mm. what that looked like, one, and I also never really had opportunities uh, to preach. But I remember the when people ask me, how did you learn how to preach? I, I look back and I recall there was a time when I was leading a Bible study with a bunch of youth group kids, mm -hmm. um, and I was just like a volunteer um, in college, and um, it was just like, I don't know, like a, a group of maybe 10 kids. And I had, a, I had a list of them on paper. And I remember every week I told myself in order to steward these students, um, I will give them a call. Um, once a week, I will give each of them a call. And I, every time I would call them, at first it would be the casual, how are you doing? Blah, 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 small talk. And then I would just start to share and encourage and hear from the spirit and communicate 
communicate with them and articulate biblical concepts. And I recall during those moments, even though there was no opportunity, no one was patting me on the back saying like, you do so great. But I felt this swell of God's presence, this um, just this affirmation from the Lord. Like I felt whole in God. I felt like this is um, this is right, not because people tell me it's right, but because I feel so one with the Lord as I'm doing it. And that's actually how I started learning how to preach. It was just from those meager phone calls uh, that I would do every single week to those youth group kids. So by the time the opportunity opened up for me to actually do it on a pulpit. For me, it actually wasn't that hard because how I would preach over the phone was how I would start to preach on the pulpit. If you're somebody that feels that your life is too small of a piece to have an effect on eternity, have an effect on the world, let me tell you, the Bible is filled with characters that were insignificant in their time, but it was God that made their lives significant. Kingdom significance is something that God gives. It's not what humankind gives to one another. We could give each other temporary fame, but at the end of the day, God determines the eternal significance of our lives. And so be faithful. Be faithful with what you have before you, because I am sure Mary did not know that she will be an iconic uh, character in the Bible for the rest of human existence. Like, I'm sure she did not know because all she did was she was faithful in her life. She was stewarding her pregnancy and raised a child. And so if you are discouraged about your life, know that it is God that provides that kingdom significance. For me, the stewarding part comes in maybe the first time that I shared my story from a platform. Um, A pastor had called me and said, um, all the women from my church are coming to this conference that I was at with lots of other people. It wasn't just me. Um, But my wife's not coming. She suffers severely with clinical depression. She takes uh, medication, but nobody in our church knows because she thinks it would hurt my ministry. Is there any way you would meet with her privately? And because she wouldn't come to that. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, if she's willing to. And I remember um, inviting her to come to the hotel where I was staying and inviting her. We found a room and she wouldn't even make eye contact with me. Mm. And I I said to listen, you don't have to tell me anything about your life. But if you don't mind, I would like to tell you a little of my story. And I shared with her. And I have to say those two hours were two of the most precious hours I've ever had in my life. And I'll never forget the two of us ending up on our knees together, thanking God for his faithfulness. And the sight of her running out of that room into her husband's arms, I remember saying, Lord, I would do all of that again for that one woman. All of it, because it's like it's like you're drowning and there's no hope and you're going under for the third time mm-hmm. and Jesus reaches in and he grabs hold of you and he pulls you free and then you get to look down and see there's somebody else and you get to reach in in his name and grab hold of them and let them know Jesus is here. To me, that's when you know this is what it was always about. It yes. wasn't about what you said to the however many thousand people on the platform. It was about this one woman mm-hmm. who is... To, to her, she's the unseen woman in the crowd, you know, the woman of the issue of blood that it was never given a name in scripture. But, but, but when Jesus is there, it, it changes everything. And to me, that's the most beautiful gift of stewarding our suffering. Um, and it's just, it's the mystery of the kingdom and it's glorious.